My name is Anna Gjnoabusa. I'm the director of the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies. And it's my great pleasure today to welcome Mark Howard, who is a professor of government at Georgetown University and the director of the Prisons and Justice Initiative. He's a scholar of enormous depth and breadth, having published award-winning books on civil society in post-communist Europe, the politics of citizenship in Europe, and communist legacy. Um, his intellectual energy is boundless. After getting tenure as a professor, he then obtained a JD degree um, at the Georgetown Law School and also serves as an assistant tennis coach um, at that university. So he's basically more time than most of us have every day. Um, moreover, unlike many academics, um, Mark combines both ethical commitment and scholarship. He took a deeply personal interest in the issue of wrongful convictions in the American justice system, having worked for nearly two decades to free a childhood friend who was wrongfully convicted. He taught prisoners at the Jessup Correctional Institute for several years, an experience that led him to create and lead the Prisons and Justice Initiative to raise awareness and to find solutions to the problem of mass incarceration. So today we're delighted to welcome him as he presents Learning from Europe, Prisons, Punishment, and American Exceptionalism. Welcome, Mark. Thanks so much, Anna. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for the introduction, uh, the invitation, but also for coming through, Anna, on your promise of good weather. Because when Anna first invited me, I said, you know, I think late April uh, would suit uh, my taste a little better. I was very nervous about uh, canceled flights and so on, and she gave me a personal guarantee that there would be no weather problems, and so you came through on that. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I better make it out. I teach in the morning at Georgetown. Um, so Isaiah Berlin taught us that there are two types of people. Anyone remember that one? They're hedgehogs and foxes. So as you might be able to tell from Anna's introduction, I'm more of a fox than a hedgehog in that I've jumped around from project to project looking at different things. I like to think going into some depth still, not in a superficial way, but having started as sort of an East Europeanist looking at post-communist democracies, then having moved a little bit to Western Europe looking at immigration and citizenship, in a neighboring context. Uh, now, after having gotten a JD, uh, I've been working on prisons and punishment and mass incarceration. Um, Anna gave away a little bit sort of the personal story that led up to that, but I want to go into a little bit more depth um, because it's an unusual story. And, and for me, it's something that's allowed me to bring together what was a longstanding personal interest with my research and teaching agenda in a way that's very satisfying and something that I'm very passionate about. So the short version of the story, there are sort of two parts. One, I think a more minor part and one that I haven't really uh, been very public about but uh, have now in a, in a uh, forthcoming book have written about it in the preface. Um, I had an early beginning as a juvenile delinquent myself. Um, and actually spent much of uh, a day at age 13 locked up in a jail cell in London um, for shoplifting uh, and then was committing other minor acts of idiocy the way young people do at times. Uh, but fortunately, was able to turn things around and age out, as they say, of that type of, of phase and turn things around. Unfortunately, not everybody's so lucky, as uh, I'm going to talk about uh, today, and particularly in this country. Uh, when it happened to me, it was actually in Europe, in the UK, uh, where I was for a very short period. Um, but for many juveniles in this country, unfortunately, it starts them down a path that leads very quickly to a long-term prison sentence. Um, the other part of the story has to do with my childhood friend, Marty Tankliff. Um, I've known him since the age of three. We weren't always close friends, but we were always friendly and acquaintances slash friends. And the first day of our senior year of high school, uh, when we, were, we just turned 17, he woke up to find his parents brutally murdered in his house and was taken to the police station, ostensibly to talk about the father's business partner who had a serious motive and opportunity to have committed the crime, who'd been at the house until 3.30 in the morning for a poker game was the last person to leave. And the police, by the end of that day, extracted a so-called confession out of Marty, which is all a hypothetical, actually it's taken by experts on false confessions to be a textbook case of a false confession because even though technically he says, I did it, that 
the fact that nothing in the confession matches anything in the crime scene and it was all based on what was fed to him by the police actually shows that he knew nothing about the crime itself. And keep in mind, this is someone who lost his parents and was in complete shock. So by that evening, he was in handcuffs, arrested, charged with double murder. And by the next summer, he was convicted and sentenced to 50 years to life in, in an upstate New York maximum security prison. And so I was faced with the fact that this person whom I believe was innocent, this friend, and I actually wrote about it in our high school newspaper, um, The Purple Parrot. I think I'm the only journalist, so to speak, uh, in Suffolk County, New York, who actually covered the story accurately, it turns out. But he then went away. He went to jail. I went to Yale. And our lives went in different directions. Uh, we reconnected um, about a decade later. And I started to write to him and to visit him. And I discovered an extraordinary person uh, and someone I committed to and said, I'll never stop uh, working to help you whether it's inside bars or hopefully when, you're, when you get out. And uh, 17 and a half years after he went in, he was finally exonerated. Uh, and that's a long story in and of itself that maybe you'll want to hear about later. But um, there, it's, a, it's a happy ending uh, in that he was able to restart his life. He was able to get his BA shortly thereafter. He then was working as a paralegal, taking law school classes at night. He got his JD. And literally today, as we speak, he's taking the New York bar exam. Ends at 5 p.m. It, there's another day tomorrow. Uh, it's a long, grueling process. I know that having been through it myself uh, and being now, uh, having gotten a JD and passed the New York bar exam and being an attorney, it's something that I started actually initially with the mission of helping to free him. He got out actually just before I started law school, uh, but then I continued with the mission. And really what happened is that for me, it expanded way beyond just one person that I knew as an individual. That was my first hook into understanding what goes on in the criminal justice system. That was my first exposure to what police officers can and regularly do do to other people uh, in interrogation rooms and in investigations. And then I started to get involved in the innocence movement and uh, many other wrongfully convicted people that I got to know and, and got involved in cases. But then it went way beyond that as I realized that the entire criminal justice system uh, at its core um, is rotten, um, is filled with inequalities, um, filled with injustice at so many levels. And so it was this process of expanding from one person to a, a second cause of wrongful convictions to the much bigger issue of the entire structure of criminal justice. And so then I started teaching at the Jessup Correctional Institution, which is a maximum security prison in Maryland. And I teach there every week. I taught there yesterday afternoon for two and a half hours. I sometimes go in also, so I teach on Mondays, and then I also sometimes go in on Fridays every other week with Georgetown students, because I now teach a course at Georgetown where I bring the students into the prison, and they work side by side with incarcerated students. And it's really extraordinary, um, because what I've discovered is that some of the smartest students I've ever had are actually people who may have dropped out of school after eighth grade, um, may have never really had the chance to pursue an education because no one gave them that chance and no one believed in them. And so I really came to realize that intelligence and education are separate concepts and that when you provide people with that education at a much later point, their intelligence can actually rise to the top and especially when you believe in them. And that's what I've come to experience. And it's really been something that has been very powerful as someone who's been teaching for a long time, but is blown away by a group of people who on paper you would say have absolutely nothing to offer. But they are tremendous. So the next step was then the founding of this initiative, uh, which we just launched uh, at an event uh, at Georgetown a couple weeks ago. We had over 700 people in the audience. Um, there's a lot of energy and dynamism around this issue, and I think it's the case uh, nationwide that we're at a time where people are realizing that there are tremendous problems with the criminal justice system. Um, I think it's a confluence of both the rise in incarceration, which I'm going to talk about in a minute when I actually get to my talk, and um, the attention that's been given through videotapes, through new technology that people have been able to get a window 
on what has often been going on in many cases for decades, if not centuries. Um, that certain groups of the population in this country have been exposed to and known about for a long time, but others are only seeing now for the first time thanks to videotape. Anyway, after that longish introduction, um, I want to get into the book project that I've been working on that I'm nearly finished with. Uh, and I want to just start by giving, showing you some figures that maybe not everybody here is familiar with uh, the issue of mass incarceration and the changes in mass incarceration. But I want to uh, give you a sense of how the U.S. fits in comparatively, because it's a comparative project. Even though I've changed projects, I've always remained a comparativist. Now I'm bringing in the U.S into my comparative sweep, but also trying to learn from European cases that I know well and have studied for a long time in other contexts. So the starting point here is looking at the U.S. in terms of prison population rates. So if you look at this figure, um, this shows prison population rate per 100,000 people. This is the common way of measuring incarceration rates. And the U.S. is the only country in the world that has more than 700 people per 100,000. Um, next closest is Russia, which hardly has a model judicial system. Um, and then there's some others uh, that are also quite high. Um, but the U.S. is, even in a global perspective, just completely off the charts on the high end. Now let's look at it compared to um, OECD countries. Right. These are the countries the U.S. typically would fit in with in terms of politics and economics and other sort of socioeconomic variables. All right. The U.S. is on the far right, about 750 people per 100,000. The next closest, New Zealand, under 200. Most European countries at or below 100. All right. So in other words, over seven times higher, essentially, in the U.S. than in comparable countries. These are countries that the U.S. fits in with on most measures that people would look at. So something is really off here. Something is different here with mass incarceration. Let me break it down in a few uh, other groups. Women incarcerated. Right? This is not just men. In this sense, the U.S. is an equal opportunity incarcerator. Not equal in terms of race, as we'll see, but certainly, um, oops, where I jumped. Um, uh, now, it's not nearly as high, obviously, as met with men, and that's the case in all countries, but much higher than in other countries where the incarceration rate for women is extremely low, but in the U.S. And it's actually the fastest growing group in American prisons is women, particularly African American women. Um, juveniles, again, the U.S. on the high end incarcerates at extraordinarily high rates when you think about this. This is ages 10 to 17 of people who are locked up, who are deprived of their liberty. Um, this is in a country that calls itself the land of the free. Now this looks at the question over time. Right, so before those were snapshots of today or the most recent figures. Um, the question is, was it always this way? And this is what I want to get at. I want to, so I want to look at both the U.S. comparatively in a cross-section today, and then also how it has changed over time. And so there are two different measures here, just to be clear. So the numbers here represent the, what you've been seeing before, incarceration rate, number of people incarcerated per 100,000, so going up to 750. Dropped actually a little bit um, over the last few years. Um, and we can talk about that perhaps afterwards, whether that represents a significant uh, change or not. Um, but basically, was relatively flat up until around the 1970s, and then just shot up. Right. So there's something that went on here starting, especially in 1980, the Reagan presidency, war on drugs, a major part of it. But then, let's not forget, in the Clinton years is where Bill Clinton, of course, uh, former president and husband of the leading uh, contender uh, in one of the parties today, also a proud Georgetown alumnus, I always point this out at Georgetown, was responsible for the largest rise uh, in terms of absolute numbers of uh, people incarcerated. So something changed at some point, right? These 
are relatively stable, and then it just jumped and skyrocketed. Now, we also need to remember that incarceration rate is one thing, so when people are presently locked up behind bars. But there's the whole carceral system that actually reaches over 7 million people. And so that includes people who are out on parole or who are on probation, which basically means that they're one step away from going back into prison. So that means one failed drug test. So we know one joint, uh, one missed parole date, uh, one you know, going out of the geographic area that they're limited to, one slip up of any kind and they're right back in. So when you think of it this way, there really are you know, not just 2.3 million but 7 million people who are, fall under the, some form of carceral supervision. Now, we also have to look at this issue in terms of race and ethnicity uh, because that's clearly um, so dominant. Uh, the disparity is just so massive today. Um, and I have it both for men and women. Um, in terms of women, um, this is so African American in the yellow, um, over double the rate of white women, almost double rate of Latino women. Those are pretty big differences, but it's a much greater even when you look at African American men, um, where um, overall they're over six times more likely to be incarcerated than white men. And then, of course, the difference between Hispanic and white men is still pretty huge, um, well over double, almost triple. Um, so there are really major uh, racial and ethnic disparities um, in the criminal justice system. So coming back now, I know there's one more statistic here that I uh, wanted to mention. So this is the lifetime likelihood of imprisonment U.S. residents born in 2001. So somebody born in 2001 has these chances, depending on what group they're in. And I like that year because my daughter was born in that year, so I can really think of actual people that I know born in that year. All right, so my daughter might have a 1 in 111 chance of going to prison. Actually, her chance is 1 in 1 because she knows so much about prisons from me that she really wants to go to prison. She wants to go on Friday with my class to visit a prison. Um, and that's still under negotiation. But anyway, you understand the, the difference. So you see um, what the odds are. But this is the one that really jumps out at you, that an African-American male born in 2001 has a one in three chance of going to prison at some point in his life. Um, and for Latino men, one in six. Um, really um, staggering um, odds. And actually, the statistic, I don't have it up here, but that really blows me away, is that for an African-American male who um, did not graduate from high school, there is, I believe the number is an 86% chance of being incarcerated at some point in his life, which is almost a sentence in and of itself. African-American male without a high school degree. Um, so the, the, there's these disparities are there, they're undeniable, they're massive, um, and I'll get to a little bit what they stem from uh, in a few minutes. But I want to come back to the comparative uh, part of it here. And this is what I want to focus on for the rest of the talk as I do in the book. Because um, I think this figure highlights both the American exceptionalism and the timing of it well. So if I really could put only one figure up, this would be the one that I would put. Because really when you look at the U.S. here, comparatively, if we just stopped it here in 1971, you would say, okay, it's, it's higher. So you might even say there's some American exceptionalism. It's somewhat more punitive. Um, okay, well, it's not that much higher than Finland in 1971, but it's certainly a little bit higher. But it's still, I would say, within the ballpark. Right? But then here, the 70s hit, and it's, no, it's another universe altogether. And so I think this really captures well both the fact that it wasn't so different before and it's become so massively different since. So it really gets at that issue of change. And also looking at Europe, what I think is revealing as well, 
gone up a little bit, maybe the average here, but not all that much. Um, Finland is a fascinating case because Finland, they made a conscious decision, a policy decision to reduce their incarceration. And there are critics who said, this is crazy because crime is going to go up. If you're letting people out of prison who had earlier committed crimes, therefore they are criminals, they're going to commit other crimes and crime rate will go up. And it didn't go up. And it's remarkable. And I think it's a really important example today when you look at certain American states that are having this conversation, California's reduced its population by 25 percent. And all of these people, including the now late Justice Scalia, were saying this is crazy because in crime rates are going to go up. We're letting all these criminals out. Crime rate has not gone up in California. The crime rate has not gone up in New York or New Jersey, two other states that have reduced their incarceration rates by 20 percent in the last five years. So that's something that's very, very uh, important. And when you look at crime rates overall, in the U.S. and Europe, and Canada for that matter, they fluctuate together. They have to do with global economic situation. They go up sometimes, they go down sometimes, but they kind of work together. Whereas incarceration rates in the U.S. don't go with the other countries. In Canada, if I had Canada here, Canada would be, you know, right along this line of about 100 with similar crimes. So, so I think it's really important to remember that crime and incarceration are not related, despite the fact that many politicians want you to believe that they are. And they want to scare you into believing that they are. And they use a logic that is appealing intuitively because you think, oh, if you're letting criminal out, they're going to commit crime and crime will therefore go up. But they're missing some key parts there. Okay, so moving on then from this um, comparative perspective. This is very revealing, and I think this alone shows that there are these huge disparities, but it's only really the beginning in that it's a very rough measure. It's a proxy, essentially, these incarceration rates. And it tells you how many people are locked up at any given point, but it doesn't tell you much beyond that. And there's a lot more to know and to inquire about. And so that's what I do in the book. So. I try to dig much deeper, uh, and basically this gives you a sense of the table of contents after chapter one, which is an introduction. And I frame it in terms of the life cycle of criminal justice, which has a number of different steps. And I leave out capital punishment, which of course is the end of the life cycle, because that's a whole different beast. But of course we know there, it's clear as day, the disparity between the U.S., which is the one civilized democratic country that still has capital punishment at least in over 30 states and European countries that have not had capital punishment since the 19, early 1980s. So um, I look at um, plea bargaining, sentencing, prison conditions, rehabilitation within prisons, parole, societal reentry, all of which then get to the question of what explains American punitiveness. And then in terms of comparisons, I look at France, Germany, and the UK which are countries that I know well from prior research. I should say also, full disclosure, I'm a French citizen. My mother's French. I've grown up in both countries and with both languages. So let me go through, if I can, these different, uh, psych these different parts of the criminal justice life cycle and give you a sense each time of how the U.S. compares. Right, so rather than just end the conversation, which really is what most comparative analyses of criminal justice do, they say, Incarceration rates, look, the U.S. is different, and now let's focus on the U.S. What I'm doing that's different is I want to go beyond incarceration rates and look at these much more detailed issues um, and then try to explain why the U.S. is so different across the board and then hopefully come to some solutions that the U.S. can learn from. And that's where I think the European stories are very important and perhaps uh, providing models uh, for the U.S. on criminal justice. So um, first, uh, start with plea bargaining. Uh, and let me ask a question. How many people have watched the show Law and Order? Admit it. Okay. Most people in the room have. Most people in the country have. Most people have watched it many times, and most people like it. Um, it's a well-done show. It's very appealing. It has good characters, good drama. Um, it also has really good courtroom drama because 
having a setting with a judge, with a jury, with a trial, with lawyers, speaking and advocating and making arguments uh, works well on a TV show. So actually, if you look, as somebody apparently did, <laughs> and you measure the outcomes of Law and Order episodes for the first 10 seasons, you see that about 37 percent end with a plea bargain. Right, now, plea bargaining isn't exactly a good drama. Does anyone know what the actual percentage of criminal cases that end in a plea bargain, what it is? 95 percent. Yeah, it was 90 a decade ago. It's gone up to 95. I don't know what the limit is. 99, it's been going up steadily. So that means that even though it's enshrined in the Constitution, the right to a trial by jury, that only 5% of defendants actually get to a trial by jury. Now, you could say, well, they're not choosing to. You could say, well, a plea bargain is a way of getting a softer sentence, a lighter outcome. But that's a very naive understanding of the way the plea bargaining process works. Because plea bargaining, which sounds innocuous, and it's based on a principle known as voluntariness, that both parties are voluntarily negotiating and coming up with this agreement, in reality is an extraordinarily unfair system. It's very efficient, so it's practical, and given the massive number of criminal cases that are out there, it's a way of passing them through the meat grinder, if you will, because the system would ultimately break down if you had the other 95 percent of cases going to a jury trial. Right? It simply wouldn't be possible. It would take 15 years to have your case go to trial. And so the result is passing it through, through plea bargaining. And what happens in plea bargaining is that it's not an equal fight. It's based on, an, in the U.S., an adversarial model where you've got the prosecution, the defense, they fight it out. Whoever has the best story, most convincing story wins. In the plea bargaining process, it's supposed to be about negotiating based on what the facts of the case are and coming to an agreement that suits both parties so that maybe they drop the charge a little bit and then the defendant says, okay, I'll plead guilty and I'll take 10 years instead of 20. The reality is that the prosecutor holds all the cards. So the prosecutor can threaten higher charges unless they take a plea, and all of the mechanism of a criminal justice proceeding is built to push towards a plea bargain outcome. So that means what's known as overcharging. It also involves judges playing a very strong role. Judges don't want backlogs on their docket, so pushing um, for a plea bargaining. It also means what essentially is called the trial penalty, which is if you say, no, I refuse that plea, and there are many reasons why somebody might have a defense. Someone put them up to it, they're under duress, they're self-defense, uh, just a complex situation. They've been abused. I mean, there, there are all sorts of things that come out with an investigation and proper legal work um, in defending a case. Um, but if they choose to go to trial, they will get a trial penalty, which will be an extremely severe sentence. So it's, a, it's actually a game of chicken, and it's a threat that many people, including many innocent people, decide not to take that risk, and so they take the plea. There was an extraordinary case. In, in the social sciences, we like to think of natural experiments as being the gold standard for research. Well, there was an actual natural experiment where, in the, in the case of, Her, in a town called Hearn, Texas, where an informant had given the names of 36 people who supposedly were drug dealers. And the informant, it was later shown, had made up all of the names. They were all innocent. They all had nothing to do with it. But 12 of them wound up pleading guilty and signing a plea bargain, which actually is lasting and is still on their record. And there, there's a woman in a documentary called The Plea who tearfully talks about how she lost her children, she lost her housing, she's homeless, she works at a uh, soup kitchen for $5 an hour and so on because she took this plea. And the reason why she took this plea is because she was locked up in jail until she took the plea. She didn't have the means to pay for bail. So there's this whole system of bail, which is a financial incentive so that you return to court, but it's set at a high level. Most people who are in the criminal justice system are poor. You can't afford bail. You're stuck in jail. 
And if you're stuck in jail, the only thing you want is to come out. And what they offer you to come out is a plea bargain. And so you have people who take a plea bargain, whether they're guilty or innocent, because of this incredible pressure to come back to their kids, to come back to their job, to try to resume their life. The problem is, as we'll learn later, when you take the plea bargain, it's a criminal conviction and you have a criminal record. So, so plea bargaining is a, not quite uniquely, but strongly American phenomenon. There are other countries that have embarked uh, on uh, some plea bargaining reform. Um, France and Germany and Britain has its own version of it. But it's actually very limited what they do. One, it's for minor cases where they're typically where the sent maximum sentence would not be more than two years. So they're not dealing with it in, in terms of cases where people are going away for 10 and 20 years and, and more. Um, and it's also done with procedures that are meant to uh, enhance the rights of the defendant. So it's sort of voluntariness plus a great deal of assurance that somebody actually is really understanding what it means and that it's something that they're choosing to do, not being pressured to do. Um, so um, plea bargaining is something that I think most people don't really think of as part of criminal justice. Um, it's certainly not shown much on shows like Law and Order, but it really is the way that most criminal justice takes place in America, 95%. Federal level, state level, same thing. Um, and it's all in the interest of efficiency, but what really comes out of it is a great deal of injustice. And that's a distinctly American phenomenon, the way that that plea bargaining model works. Now I want to turn to sentencing. So um, the comparative data on sentencing is pretty tricky. Um, there aren't really that many good comparative studies. It's a difficult thing to measure because crimes are defined differently in different countries. Um, so there's not just sort of some quick and easy database that you can go to. Um, but most studies that try to compare different sentences for different crimes find a very clear conclusion, which is that you get a much stiffer sentence, a much longer sentence for the typical crime, uh, for, for any level of crime in the U.S. than in other countries. Uh, it's a very um, clear pattern. Similar crimes, be it burglary, robbery, breaking and entering, or assault, or other things, get a longer prison sentence in the U.S. than they do in other countries. Now, drug crimes, it goes without saying, massive, massive differences. Right? I mean, you can go away for 15 years for something that you can do legally in, in the Netherlands or now Portugal. Um, but I don't want to focus just on drug crimes. And there's a tendency these days to just look at nonviolent drug offenders and s get the impression that they're the ones filling the American prison system. That's probably 17 percent or so of the American prison population. Um, which isn't means to say the other 87 percent, uh, sorry, the other 83 percent are, are necessarily violent offenders, but there are many different types of, of crimes that are in there. Of course, many of them are also involving drugs in the drug trade and, and crimes committed while on drugs or trying to get drugs and so on. Um, but I think there's a little too much focus on drugs. But certainly, in terms of sentencing, that focus is correct, that there's just massive uh, disparities in terms of drugs. There's also been a tremendous expansion in life sentences that are given in the U.S. So this, the, the sentence of, of life um, has increased, and I have a figure here that shows uh, the increase from, you know, from in, in this span of, of uh, almost 30 years um, has gone up uh, by 470 um, percent. So it's really a, a tremendous increase um, of what really is the maximum sentence that can be given other than a capital sentence. Then there's this phenomenon here on the right of LWAP, life without parole. So LWAP sentences have become very popular. And actually, one of the things that worries me in the campaign against or sort of for the elimination of capital punishment is that many people are quick to say, oh, just give them life without parole. Just give them life without parole. And so that there's been a, a lot of pushing into that category as if that's sort of, you know, no big deal. It's actually extraordinarily rare in any other country but the U.S. Right? And I'll get into the parole side of things, too, how that's been changing. Um, but LWAP sent sentences have gone up by nearly 400 percent in just 20 years. Right? Then there's the issue of juveniles having life without parole, um, which is something that the Supreme Court in 2012, in a five to four opinion uh, written by Justice Kennedy, said mandatory life without parole was unconstitutional. 
And in other words, that was a statute in the state of Florida that said certain types of crime, first degree murder, would be, have a mandatory life without parole sentence, that that mandatory part of it was unconstitutional, but it still means you can have a judge or a jury find a sentence of life without parole for juveniles. Even though there's tremendous research about juvenile brains being formed differently and taking more time and you know, prefrontal cortex not being formed and so on. So, um, so there's been this explosion of um, life sentences. And I'll also get to what these sentences mean in terms of people being able to get out. Because in principle, life sentences here, this means life with parole. Or actually, this includes life with parole and without parole. This is just life without parole. Um, but what I'll get to when I talk about parole is that discretionary parole has basically disappeared as a concept. A concept. Um, it's very, very hard for people who have a term to life. So there might be 25 to life. Back when Marty got sentenced, it was 50 to life. When we hear that, we think the number. But almost always now, it is the high end, which means life. Or it certainly would be many, many years beyond that minimum, many, many times of applying for parole and being denied parole. And the typical reason why people are rejected for parole, the, reason, the official reason that's given, is actually often about the nature of the crime itself which is a bit paradoxical because typically you're sentenced for the crime that was committed. Right? That's what the sentence is for. So the parole is, should be, in theory, based on your behavior, your conduct, since you've been incarcerated. But they bring back up the original crime as a reason to deny people parole who have passed the minimum term of their sentence, which I think is un indefensible. Um, now, how did this sentencing change? So this looks at life, but it's also for all kinds of other sentences. It's, uh, it's gone up, it's gone up, it's gone up. Um, these were specific policy choices that were made. They were made in many states. California tended to lead the way, um, but it also happened on the federal level and in, and in most states where there was a shift from indeterminate sentencing to determinate sentencing. So initially, there were types of sentences that had ranges on them, 10 to 15, or there'd be the discretion of the judge, or there'd be the sense that, well, people can get out early or you know, maybe serve a third of their sentence. There was a time in American history where people would serve about a third of their sentence and then be released. That was viewed as being insufficient, and I can certainly understand the reasons for that you know, being unacceptable. What's the point of giving a sentence if you're letting someone out after a third? But that was the common practice. In fact, many judges would actually send someone away saying, I'm sentencing you to 30 years, but you should know that most likely you'll be able to get out after you know, 10, 12 years. But then there was this move towards determinate sentencing and truth in sentencing policies, where basically the sentence means the sentence. You don't get out earlier, or there's an 85% minimum of the sentence that people had to serve before having a chance to even apply for parole and have a chance of getting out. There are also three strikes laws, um, you know, very um, controversial. Um, you know, we like to bring up examples. Uh, they're crazy examples. You know, somebody, f you know, three types of theft. The third one being stealing a golf club in a sporting goods store. The guy put it into his pants, down the pant leg, walked out the store, got caught. He'd done something like that twice before and got life without parole. And the Supreme Court said that is constitutional. The voters in that state, and it happened in California first, and it happened in many other states, including in Michigan, have said that that is an appropriate way to punish crime. They knew about it. The prior crimes were considered felonies. There's someone also for passing bad checks. The checks were in the $30 to $50 range, and there were three of them that were passed. They bounced, and the person knew that they would bounce and got life without parole. So that was viewed as acceptable by a vast majority of the population. I don't think they were necessarily focusing on these cases. They were focusing on the fear-mongering cases, of the sort of really you know, violent criminals who were acting out again and again. And again, I can certainly understand. I don't think that somebody who's a serial rapist should be getting out uh, anytime soon. I think when so there are certain types of crimes where there's a real danger to society and somebody needs to be separated from society, but there, three strikes laws were sweeping all types of felonies in together. 
Um, in Europe, um, the sentences haven't changed that much. Um, they are um, indeterminate in the sense that there is a range and there's also a lot of discretion that's given to judges um, based on the circumstances and there's also a reevaluation of the person when the person's incarcerated. Um, so they typically tend to be shorter. But I'll also get into what happens inside prison, which is the idea of helping people to be prepared to be coming out, which is not what's happening in American prisons. So let me move into um, prison conditions next. So one thing I realized when I started doing this research is that many people assume that prison is prison, that you get sent away somewhere, you get locked up, you get deprived of your liberty, that that is the same thing in different contexts. And what I've come to learn in spending time in prisons, in prisons in, in different countries, and many different facilities in the U.S. is that there's just a wide spectrum of different types of facilities. Typically, they're classified by security level, um, but also um, different levels of restriction on people's uh, freedom of movement, um, different levels of overcrowding, and so on. Now, even within the U.S., it's hard to generalize because there are a lot of different facilities. But typically, most prisons in the U.S., and this is not surprising given what you saw about the incarceration rates, are tremendously overcrowded. So I would just want to show you just some images that speak louder than words. And these are actually taken from a Supreme Court ruling, one of the few rulings that actually pushed back in the other direction, PLATA, from uh, the state of, um, state of uh, California, which actually has mandated California, which is the reason why California has had to reduce its incarceration rate and crime has not gone up all that again. Um, there are two features uh, to these images. Um, one is just the tremendous overcrowding. These pictures are in the, what used to be the gym, where in the old days, incarcerated people could play sports, run around, play basketball, whatever. They're so overcrowded that they've packed these cots, and they're two or three high. And you see what the room looks like, where there are thousands of people who are all together confined in this tight space. They're incredibly dangerous, they're incredibly violent, they're unsanitary, and there's nowhere else to go. I mean, this was the space to go have some space and run around and, and you know, do something. Um, and then the other feature, of course, is solitary confinement, which is a, a distinctly American phenomenon that other countries do not have, that other countries view as torture as human rights violation. But there are over, there are over 80,000, some estimates range from 80,000 to 100,000 people at any given moment who are in solitary confinement in the United States, which is actually more than there are people in each European country in prison at all. But of course, the population sizes are a little different. But it's a massive number. And so this is an example of supermax, where there's actually complete sensory deprivation. Um, there's a toilet, there's a sink. And lucky here to have a window. Many don't even have any light, any natural light at all. They often keep the fluorescent lights on 24-7. Um, in some cases, they might have reading material. Um, but you get a sense of how barren this existence is. Um, this shows another example of a, a supermax type facility where the entire purpose of it is deprivation of all senses and of all human contact. And I've met people who've been in solitary confinement and talked to them. And what they describe is, is so cruel and unusual that it's just unimaginable. And there are studies of rats that are placed for two weeks in, by themselves in a little box. And then they put them into the rat population. And they can no longer socialize with the other rats. And there's many humans who are put in that situation and actually who get out at some point, and they leave solitary, and they go into society. And how do you think they do? How do you think they function? Not very well. It clearly doesn't prepare people for a productive reentry into society. So I think these images highlight nicely a series of points that I'm able to make in this chapter, where I go through the different conditions and different aspects of prison conditions in the US compared to France, Germany, and the UK. Uh, whether it's living space, the overcrowding is tremendous. The facilities, now here I should add a caveat that some European facilities, particularly older facilities, are terrible. 
I mean, there are French prisons where there are rats everywhere, where the plumbing is leaking, that were built in the 18th century. Um, so I don't want to suggest that any of these places are a paradise. Only Norway, maybe, where there's this Bestoy prison on this island paradise. Um, that's an exception that Michael Moore has a, a part of uh, that didn't actually make it into the movie um, Sicko, but that's available on YouTube and it's sort of legendary among the prisoner uh, rights community. Um, or maybe it's going a little bit too far, but um, the but but in uh, European countries, um, even though there is relative overcrowding, and even though it's still a rough place and nobody would want to go there, it doesn't approach these types of conditions. And other aspects like the food um, that's provided. I mean, they, the way that food gets determined here is based on the budget. It is the cheapest food that can be available. And there's a thing called the Nutra loaf that is given in certain prisons that is basically looks like a piece of cardboard and that apparently has the exact minimum nutritional requirements that they have to put into the food that they serve that has absolutely no flavor or taste that's repulsive and that's what they serve and it costs 67 cents a loaf to provide. Now I don't want to suggest that the food that people are eating in European prisons is wonderful but they have warm meals and there's a tradition of even the most degraded people having a right to a certain standard that they're afforded. So um, other issues that involve contact with the outside world. Um, there are credible restrictions um, on contact with prisoners. It's why for me it's taken me a long time to go these steps of teaching in a prison, get, having contact with people. There are all kinds of restrictions on mail, on visits. Uh, there are um, phone calls are extraordinarily expensive. Video visitation is the new thing. They call it Skype for prison. It has nothing to do with Skype. It costs $1.50 a minute. Um, the calls fall off. They have a connection fee of $5. And these are the poorest of the poor members of society. And the way that the uh, phone slash video companies are able to get their contracts to set up the service in the prison is that the prison agrees that they will stop all in-person visits if they set up this video visit. So they make it sound like it's a good thing. Oh, you can Skype all the time. It's really expensive. It's really hard to do. It's really poor quality. And it means you can no longer actually see your loved one. Right? And if there's one clear indicator of someone's chances of successfully coming out of prison and being able to function, it's having connections to the outside world, and typically that's through family. And when that is cut off, and most prisons in the U.S. are built in rural places far away from cities where most people come from, intentionally set up in a way to actually cut those ties that are so important. It's actually setting people up to fail. On that note, let me move to rehabilitation. Um, you know, we still use the term corrections, but it's just a word at this point. Because really what prisons are about is punishment. It's about retribution. It's about warehousing. And so, there used to be a whole series of programs. Uh, there were education programs. Uh, there were different types of, of job training programs, different types of activities to keep people busy, to keep people learning, to help them better themselves. They all were stopped at this time period in the mid to late 1970s and 1980s, all based on one social scientist completely erroneous report. A guy named Robert Martinson wrote a report in 1974 called What Works that was looking at different programs in correctional facilities and his answer was nothing works. Five years later he wrote a retraction. He said I had it wrong and all these people had pointed out that data was wrong and he made all these mistakes. He apologized, he said it was wrong but by then the cat was out of the bag and all these programs were stopped and he actually committed suicide jumping out of his 14-story office window because he couldn't live with himself for what he'd actually set in motion. But rehabilitation has essentially disappeared. What's left of it? You're looking at it. Not only me, but it's volunteers. It's people who donate their time, who go into prison. And so you have prisons like Jessup where I teach. It's in the Baltimore-Washington corridor. There are people from the D.C. and Baltimore areas who are you know, willing and able to volunteer their time. 
It's San Quentin Prison where I visited. I actually played tennis in San Quentin Prison. They have a tennis program. They actually built a court there, and they have a program for people from the outside. I wrote an article about it in Sports Illustrated, which is probably the thing that more people have read than everything else I've written and will ever write combined. Um, but uh, there are people, incarcerated people, at San Quentin who are eligible for lower level security prisons elsewhere in California, but they elect to stay in San Quentin, which is a maximum security prison, because there's such great programs. And the programs are basically Berkeley, Stanford, and other volunteers who come teach there and are involved in Marin County people who come play tennis or whatever. Um, but there's, a, there's an extraordinary desire for programming and for education and so on, but very little opportunity provided. The, the bottom line is, you know, it's not something that wardens want to include in their budget. So when volunteers can do it, it works very well. And there's great research on the power, particularly of education. In, when people acquire a GED, recidivism goes down. When people acquire a college degree, recidivism plummets. The Bard College pr Prison uh, Initiative, which is a, unbelievable, leading the way in terms of prison education, where peop people incarcerated get a Bard College degree while they're incarcerated, they have a 2% recidivism rate, right, where the national rate is 67%. Um, so it's really something that's extraordinary, but very little attention is paid for it. Now in Europe, again, I don't want to paint too rosy of a picture, and it, there's a lot of variation, and there are some facilities um, where there's very little going on, and there are not many opportunities for people to learn and grow. But there's a much greater understanding about the need for programming and support for programming. And when they can do it, they support it actively themselves and don't just rely on a few volunteers. Um, and there's an appreciation for the sense that when people get involved, when people are active, and when people grow and they change. I mean, what is life about but, but changing and growing? And particularly people who often as young people were involved in crime and involved in bad behavior, but giving them a chance to discover a new selves, to better themselves. And I've seen this among countless of my students who say to me as, as 50 plus year olds today, who just say, and they look at me sincerely, and they just say, you know, I, I, was, a, I was a bad kid. I, you know, some of them have been locked up since they were 16, 17. And they say, I, I needed to be sent away. I was up to no good, but I am not the same person I used to be. And why am I still being held accountable to the standard that I lived down to as a 17-year-old today? These are people who are eligible for parole but never have a chance to get it. Um, so um, the other thing that's provided many European prisons is psychologists, social workers. They're actually working with people who are incarcerated. How can we improve you? How can we monitor you? How are you doing? Just that basic question of checking in goes a long way. In the US, everyone is just a number um, because of the warehousing. The overcrowding is really plays a tremendous role in this. Um, moving on to parole, I mentioned this parole is basically something that has disappeared. Um, discretionary parole, there are two types of parole. Mandatory parole, when you get to the end of the sentence and they have to let you out. So if you have a 20 to 25 year sentence or just a certain number, they have to let you out. Or when it's something to life or it's something to some other number and you're in between, you're eligible for discretionary parole. Discretionary parole has basically plummeted. If you look at this figure, it used to be 65% of parole cases were discretionary parole. Now it's just 24%. It's very rarely given. There are a number of states where governors have simply said, I will not sign off on parole. Can anyone? Think of why that's the case. What are they afraid of? They're afraid of somebody. Right, they're afraid of. Right, so I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, they're afraid of the Willie Horton case because the ghost of Willie Horton haunts all of criminal justice. And Willie Horton is actually a student in my class at Jessup. I sat next to him yesterday, actually, for two hours. I've gotten to know him. That's another conversation. Um, but he actually f realizes how he's been exploited and how the image of him is something that people at every level are so fearful of. 
and he has a very different version of his own story that's quite interesting too. But that's the reason, even though he was a case of actually furlough, not parole, but the fear of somebody going out and committing another crime and then it coming back to haunt the politician who is somehow can be accused of being responsible for it is something that's just very, very powerful. And the key difference with Europe is that the parole process, they call it conditional release. There's also sentence reduction that happens there. After you've served 50 percent of your sentence, you have a right to go in front of your original judge or another judge if you prefer and request a reduction in your sentence by saying, here's what I've done in prison, here's how I've changed. And the judge can accept or reject it or say you can come back in another year or two or whatever and reapply. But they have hope. Whereas in the U.S., and I see this, there are people who are just hopeless because they're never going to get that chance. And the reason why is because it's a part of the political process, is that politicians who may make a decision that will lead to another crime being committed will be highly publicized. It will affect them. In the European countries, it happens on the judicial level. Judges aren't elected. The politicians are separate from it. So it's through its own little process. And I've talked to judges in France about this. And what would it be like for you if someone came after you? And I said, you have, have you had people you've reduced their sentence and they went and committed other crimes? Absolutely. Well, can you imagine if that meant you were going to lose your job? Right? It's something they can't wrap their heads around, but they understand that in the American context, people simply just don't take the chance. I'd rather let you know, them all keep rotting in jail than lose my own job. Final step, societal reentry. This is when people do get out, whether it's through parole of one kind or another, um, serve the end of their sentence. They've paid their debt to society, right? We hear that expression a lot. And this is a country that believes in second chances. Many of the, the, the myths of this country are based on people having a rough beginning and having a second chance and really making it. The reality is there's no second chance or very rare second chances that are given. There's something called collateral consequences, which is that a criminal conviction, criminal record stays with you throughout your lifespan. And so that means in terms of voting, in many states you can't vote. You served your time. Now in most European countries, not the UK, the UK is an exception, but in other European countries, you can vote while you're incarcerated. They actually bring ballots to prisons in most countries. They encourage voting. In the U.S., you can do that in Maine and Vermont. They're the two states where you can vote while you're incarcerated. But in the other 48 states, you can't vote while you're incarcerated. And in many states, you can't vote after you get out for a certain number of years, and in some states, for life. So you've paid your debt to society, but you're not a citizen. How does that work? Employment. We all know about the box, right? Check the box. If have you have a prior felony conviction. You check that box, what happens to your application? It goes straight in the trash. Right. It's very, very difficult to get a job when you have a prior criminal record. Housing. If you are poor and live in public housing, you cannot go there if you have a prior criminal record. If your mother lives in public housing and you get out of prison, she will get expelled if you move in, if you even spend a night there and they find out about it. So they make it extremely hard. So many people end up, who are already poor to begin with, they end up even poor, they end up destitute, they end up homeless, they end up back in crime, back in prison. Right, so there's this cycle where the collateral consequences are extraordinarily difficult. In Europe, I don't want to, again, not a paradise, but there's an effort to help people with housing, to help people with job training, to help people with actually getting jobs, to have actual furloughs, which were ended in this country after the Horton debacle, where people for the last six months of their sentence are actually going out. They're going out uh, for short periods initially, then they're going out for the day, they're going out to a job where they go, you know, nine to five and they come back. And if they come back late, then they lose the privilege. Um, it, but it's something that's meant to get people ready to function in society rather than just dump them, you know, at the prison gates. So finally, um, putting it all together, and I need to wrap it up, I realize, I think it's very clear, and more so than just looking at the incarceration rates, that the U.S. is unusually cruel. 
And that's the title of my book. And it happens at all of these stages. Right? There's a coercive plea bargaining process. There's not a fair trial that you're guaranteed to according to the Constitution. The prison sentence, sentences are incredibly long, much longer than in other comparable, co comparable countries. The conditions within prisons are violent. They're unhealthy. They're unsanitary. Rehabilitation has essentially disappeared as a goal. The chances for discretionary parole have all but disappeared. And then the obstacles for reintegration in society after you're released are tremendous. All right, so then what explains this exceptionalism? Basically, um, I get it developed four factors, and I'm just going to say something about each of them briefly. Um, remember, for each of them, what I'm interested in is not just American exceptionalism, how they're different from Europe, but how they've changed within the U.S. So race, religion, politics, and business. Race, obviously, there's a long-standing history of racial discrimination, particularly against African Americans in this country, going back to slavery, then going on to convict leasing, which is a period that not many people know about, but very, very important. Then Jim Crow laws. And the new version of it is mass incarceration. I don't want to oversimplify. Michelle Alexander's made an excellent argument that has really helped to draw attention to this larger cause and the situation. It's not quite that simple where it's a direct line, but that is the new version of the attempt to subjugate African-American men in this country, is to lock them up. Right? There were other attempts that were done in different ways previously in history. In terms of religion, here I draw a lot on Anna's recent book, which is excellent, which looks at the rise of the Christian right as a political force, as a political phenomenon that brought with it, not as its central goal, but as an important part of its goal, a very retributive function based on eye for an eye, based on a harsh version of justice. And that emerged, as she's shown, Anna's shown very effectively, as a political force in the 1970s around the same time period. Right? They went from being sort of a, a, a moral issue in the background with their churches to saying we're going to organize politically and we're going to take over a particular party in American politics or a part of that party, and did so effectively. Anna Jemawa Busse. She's available to answer any questions about the argument, if you'd like. Um, third, politics. I mentioned this already. The US is the only country that elects prosecutors and most judges. And when you talk to people from other countries, they just look puzzled when you say that. How is that even possible? To become a judge in France, you have to go to law school. You have to be the best of the best in your law school top 5%, just to even qualify for the next stage. Then you have to go through this grueling exam to qualify for the École de la Magistrature, the School for Judges. Right? This, this you know, two-day long exam, it makes bar exams look like a joke. You have to do among the best scores for that exam. Then you get into the school. Then you have to excel at the school. You have to be one of the top legal minds of your generation in order to be a judge. Being a judge in many jurisdictions in the US means being a politician. You have to have a law degree. I'd be a member of the bar. But beyond that, you run for office. And how do you run for office in this country? You raise money. Right? You're part of a political party. You're part of a team. You have an agenda. You take a stand on larger issues. And I have examples of judges who are running for office campaigning based on how many people they put to death how many sentences they've overturned. So when the jury, in some states, the jury, um, the, the judge has a step beyond the jury. So the jury recommends a sentence, let's say life as opposed to death. And the judge says, no, I'm going to give death. And they're proud of it. And they campaign on it. They run for office based on it. And prosecutors, of course, it's their, you know, the win-loss column, right? It's all about for their promotions within their profession, for running for office as district attorney in jurisdictions. It's about how many cases you win. And when there's a highly publicized case, you better win that one. Because if you lose that one, you know, which means somebody that the public thought was bad gets off, you're probably out of a job next election. So that's just tremendous, and it fuels the whole tough on crime rhetoric. And then finally, and this actually I should give credit, which this came from my students at the prison, at Jessup. Uh, 
because they impressed upon me how important this business side of it. I initially had my three factors. I taught a course last spring that was based on a draft of my book. I figured what better audience to talk about comparative criminal justice issues than people who are actually living and breathing it every single minute of the day. And they helped me realize and they pointed me to literature and showed me the crucial business element to this. There, it's an $80 billion a year uh, expenditure on corrections. And there are a lot of organized forces, so it's unions of prison guards in some cases, it's private prisons in others, it's lobbyists in other cases who donate to politicians and political parties who are then pushing to build more prisons. The private prisons are built with a guaranteed occupancy rate. That's something we usually think of hotels as having an occupancy rate. Private prisons, they negotiate in their contract that there'll be a minimum 90% occupancy rate. What does that mean? Those are people who are sentenced to prison. So the state is guaranteeing that they're going to be sentencing enough people to prison because they're paying this private prison company to run a prison. I mean, it's extraordinary. So there are strong business interests that have been pushing to increase, increase, increase the mass incarceration. So finally, just to conclude, in terms of recommendations that I would have, I think there's a lot to learn from Europe. I don't want to suggest that Europe has figured it all out. I think there are some horrific cases within Europe. There are some horrible prisons within Europe. I still think prison's a terrible place, and I think prison should be a bad place. Prison should be an unwelcome place. But it should be a humane place. It should be a place where people keep their human rights when they walk in. And that is lost entirely in the American context. And when you think back to that chart, looking over time, how the U.S. was close to Europe and now has skyrocketed, and when you see the slight drop that there's been in the last two years, and people get very excited about it, and I'm happy about that, don't get me wrong. But it would take 88 years at that rate. So it would take until 2101, that, the year 2101, and we'll all be gone by then, for it to reach, go back down to the sort of norm that it was in before, to go back to 1980 levels. So I think there's a lot, there's a long way to go, but I think that these European countries do offer lessons that the U.S. can learn at every step of the way. So thank you for your patience. Uh, I get very excited and I can go on for a long time about this. I hope you've enjoyed the talk.